I can remember James Hillman saying uh, on the back of one of Robert's books, I have thieved from his mind so many times. You quoted one of those times. Uh, where That was love and the soul of the world. Um, and um, creating a future for Earth was the subtitle, which is your topic, isn't it? Yeah. Extraordinary, because that was um, that was your first major um, publication. He has about eight books out now. As you know now, Robert Sardello um, and uh, Joanne and I were a threesome um, working together to bring James Hillman, uh, and Pat was with him uh, coming to Dallas. We, when, when Robert Sardello came to the University of Dallas, he came actually after I did, a year afterward. And I remember President Donald Cowan coming to me and saying, we didn't have a psychology department at the University of Dallas. And he said, Gail, I have found you a psychologist. He's from Duquesne. <laughs> Isn't that great? And uh, so uh, it was an extraordinary thing. Joanne was working on her PhD in the graduate program in literature, and then, of course, uh, then in literature and psychology. And the three of us met weekly uh, to read. We were reading mostly phenomenology. And then one day, Robert came in with one of Hillman's books. And uh, I don't even remember which one it was. Pan and the Nightmare. And, the Nightmare. and uh, that was the end. You know, we, we read James Hillman, and here he is. He's with, he was with us, I think, within about six months. Robert Sardello, of course, helped us found the Dallas Institute. And uh, then with Cheryl Sanders Sardello, he founded the School of Spiritual Psychology. And they've run that program. Uh, they ran that program many times. Cheryl passed from this life uh, two years ago. Um, some of them in the room have been uh, studying with Robert uh, and Cheryl in the School for Spiritual Psychology. He is now operating the School for um, Spiritual Earth, a program for Spiritual Earth, living in Santa Fe. Paying attention to our Earth in a way that I have to just say I've never known anyone to pay the attention to the way we live and how we live on this terra firma on which we live. And I believe that's what you're going to talk about. Welcome, Dr. Sardella. I'm going to work with this uh, chapter, um, Good Mother Earth, Imaginal or Literal. And um, it's really uh, quite different than the other chapters. It's uh, it's compact, it's 12 pages, not four, but 12. <laughs> I would have seen the four, I would have gone there. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, immediate and it's very straightforward. Not a whole lot of um, mythological stories because he's trying to address the present in, in a different way. And certainly he makes his case for the imaginal earth very, very well in, in the chapter. But that's not the whole of it, and it's really not even the most intriguing part of where he takes us in, in, this, in this chapter. And, and there's a certain point, I'll, I'll, I'll quote the comment that he makes that I then want to try to go into and open up uh, a little more. At, at, in the beginning, he makes some very helpful autobiographical comments that uh, help you really make sense of, of James. He, he says, for example, you know, he was born and raised in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Uh, They're on the sandbar. And so he says, you know, he had a, he was, uh, he was since his birth on shaky ground. <laughs> <laughs> and in addition, he, he says he, that he has, he has no planets 
in any of the three Earth signs in his astrological chart. No planets in any of the Earth signs. Wow. So that would tend to make anyone a kind of traveling vagabond or, you know, or make someone go seeking grounding in literal Earth. And that he did neither is, uh, uh, is really given by this third autobiographical comment in which he, he speaks briefly of his time as a young man uh, when he was in India studying with Gopi Krishna. And in the India, Indian chakra systems, you know that there are actually two chakras that have to do with grounding. There's the, and it, they're both symbolized by this mighty earth being, the elephant. And uh, the, so the elephant symbolizes the root chakra for the first one that has to do with grounding, with rooting, and with physically being here. But uh, the, the, the elephant also is the symbol for the throat chakra. Throat chakra. So, so that um, it's possible to be grounded th through the word, through speaking, and, and particularly through the creative word. And I'm, I'm just very sure that was, that, that's Jim's mode of grounding. Yeah. Uh, he goes on and, and, and expresses great gratitude to the work of Gaston Vachelard. That, that, Joanne has so done so much to bring all of, her, all of his work into translation and publishing it. And Bachelard wrote two books on the earth, Earth and the Reveries of Will and Earth and the Reveries of Repose. In the first one, the, 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 there's, there's given, well, Bachelard would go through massive amounts of poetry and, and drama and art and, and, and find images. So he, there's many images of imaginal earth in these volumes. In the will volume, for example, earth is will, earth is will. And, and not just, a, that's not a quality of earth, that's the being of earth herself. I mean, just, just ask any potter, ask any potter who has to try to shape the will of clay, of earth, or, con, or bring, their will into harmony with earth as will. Or, um, or uh, think of the minor, you know, how difficult it is to find your way to the interior of the earth. Or just look around Dallas, all these machines uh, that it takes to try to move her around a little bit. <laughs> so, so earth as will. But at the same time, almost the opposite, earth is also repose. When I, when I daily walk my, my doggies down the ravine of the hills of, near Santa Fe, uh, in this, it, Santa Fe is, is it's not the vegetation so much that's the beauty, it's the, it's the earth and certainly the sky, but um, you're immediately taken into repose. Again, it's not that you repose, it's that her, it's her repose that lives within you. So earth has, has repose. And so, oh, and then Joanne, you gave me that wonderful comment also from uh, Earth and the Reveries of Repose, in which earth is contemplation. Earth is contemplation. In the same way, I walk down the ravine and, and the, the stones, the shape of the stones, the form, the color, immediately I'm in contemplation. I don't have to do anything because it's she is contemplation. So he, he, he gives us, he really develops pictures of the imaginal earth. Then he also gives us this archetypal idea of the imaginal earth in the alchemical elements of earth, air, fire, and water. The, the, those are certainly not literal. That's 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 an imaginal idea. You see. So now, though, he comes to this extraordinary moment where he uh, has says something that boy, we have to try to see if we can open up. It's very, not so easy. 
on page 311, he says, the fact that the archetypal idea of earth does literalize and concretize into physical stuff of the planet is a function of this particular element. It is earth itself that produces this idea of itself. <laughs> that is solid, palpable, dense. So dense, in fact, that we can't see through its literalism into its metaphor. Whoa, do you see? Earth herself produces the idea of herself as literal. <laughs> now, what are we going to do? Where are we going with that? <laughs> yeah. So that's the one I want to try to see if, if we can open a bit. And uh, you actually did it. <laughs> If I would have known your paper, I would have written this very, very differently. <laughs> well, let's look at, just for a brief moment at, at Gaia, at the mythology of Gaia. Um, that, you know, that produces this literalized idea of herself. Of course, one wonders, why in the world would she do that? What is she doing, doing that? <laughs> And uh, I have some ideas, but they're, they're speculations, because what would, mythically, where would you? Yeah. Gaia. So, so Gaia is a borning, B-O-R-N-I-G, is borning out of chaos in, in the theogony. Chaos doesn't mean chaotic, but it's something like stillness beyond stillness. Now I would say maybe it's okeanos. For sure. So she's, she, she's not born out of chaos. She's borning herself from this realm of chaos. So she is archetypally first. She's archetypally first, not numerically first, archetypally first. And that means, and, and, then, and she hides her priority right before our literal eyes. But it should mean that for us, in our imagination, thinking that she, she should be first in everything. She's archetypally first. She should be first in everything. Everything that we do, everything that we imagine, everything that we desire, everything that we want, everything that we long for, she should be first. Right? Because she's archetypally first. Um, For some reason, we can't see what is right beneath our feet imaginally. She gives birth to the Titans, the Cyclops, the hundred-handed giants. That, you know, has to do with she's really, 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 really angry at the sky gods. Earth, you know, then gives birth to Uranus. Gaia gives birth to Uranus. And, and Earth and sky are equal. Earth and sky are equal. Earth gives a secure place for the gods to stand. Sky gives a secure place for the gods to rest. They're equal. Well, we certainly can't get any religion to think that way that earth is equal to the heavens. So, various ways to go, I'll go this way, <laughs> to open up this enigmatic statement. Um, I'm going to go to a mythical fable, an imaginal fable, from about 64 BC. And it's, it's, it's the fable by uh, Hyginus. H-Y-G-I-N-U-S, in which it's not a leap, it's a necessary, inherent, mythical connection that is 
the, the mythical connection between the physical imaginal earth and the physical imaginal body. Because we'll find we, there's no way it's possible to, to find our way into imaginal earth if physical body is taken literally. You see, you can't do it. So, so the myth, uh, see, it's the myth of the human. It's the myth of the humus being. The humus being. The body of humus. The human being is the body of earth. The myth is uh, the mythical figure, Karus, C-A-R-U-S, Karus, who the Greek word would be sympathia, and we would translate now as care. And uh, th this, this fable was, or, or myth, was very important to Martin Heidegger, who developed his philosophy of earth based in this, in this myth. Karus makes a human form out of the mud of earth. Humus. Chorus asks Zeus to give the being a soul. And she wants the being to be named after her. But Zeus wants the name to be after him. <laughs> and then at that moment, Gaia appears and she wants the being to be named after her. Cronus comes in and makes, resolves the, the issue. He makes the determination. The soul of the human is given to Zeus. The body of the human is given to Gaia because she contributes contributes her body to the making. So the humus being is the soul body. Zeus humus, the soul body. So that the, <laughs> the human being is the earth soul body. The human being is the earth soul body. And both literal and imaginal. Simultaneously, literal and imaginal. Mind can't make sense of that. It, 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 so earth and earth soul body are a dualitude of Literal, imaginal. Duality is Corbin's word, and I think it's right in this in instance. It, it's this, you know, it's this, the, how the two-ness are a oneness. How the literal is the imaginal. While the mind splits this duality into a duality of earth and human. The mind is unable to hold that Earth, Gaia, hides her mythical presence. And the mind is unable to hold that human is humus, Earth being. See where we're going? Well, this, this capacity of, of duality to hold literal and imaginal is exactly the capacity that we need now, at this present time. So it's exactly the capacity that is lacking, so that whenever we get close at all, it splits into an opposition. For example, <clears throat> 
the protest at Standing Rock against the Dakota Pipeline and uh, is, a, is a splitting of literal and imaginal. It may seem, for example, that the Native Americans were protecting their water from pollution. That's literal. But that's not even what they were doing. The Native Americans speak of the pipeline as a black snake. It's a, an image of an, it's a, it's an imaginal being who will devour them, who will uh, cannibalize them from their true imaginal literal existence. The Native Americans do have the capacity to be imaginal literal simultaneously. One of the protesters, Standing Fox, who came from Arizona to protest, he says this. Sacred land is who we are. And it is also a reference to our ways. When land is destroyed, we lose that connection. So when any land, any land is threatened, it is important to protect it. That first part, sacred land is who we are. They are the, the, the humus, earth, soul being. Like the great Taos, New Mexico writer, says something similar in his uh, book called Masked Gods, Navajo and Pueblo Ceremonialism. Just to quote the end of it, he says, whoever he is, whatever he believes, the Native American, stems from the very soil of his ancient homeland. He is inseparable from the earth itself. Another example, I don't have time to go into, but I really recommend it, is the, the recent uh, very provocative film, Be a Trees at Dinner. I don't know if you've seen that. It's a, it's a story of a, the conflict between a, a develop, land developer and a, a healer woman from Guatemala. <laughs> and the land developer who scrapes the land and, and doesn't, he doesn't see any, has no feeling for whatever, what he's doing. He goes off to Africa and kills rhinoceros. So they get in a terrible conflict at dinner and see the film <laughs> <laughs> of what happens. But it's that, do you see, if we get close at all, literal splits from imaginal. Yeah. Okay, to finish, I have two possible endings. Mm. Sort of like, <laughs> other one, we need to say this. See, that, that, that America is the, is the place where the presence of the imaginal literal earth is most present. It, it's our culture. It's not our culture. It's the, it's the Native American culture. Um, Incidentally, you know, the, the, they don't like the name Native Americans, nor do they like the name Indians. And when Columbus came to America, he, he didn't call them Indians. He knew he wasn't in, in, in the Indies. <laughs> he called them Indios. Indios. In the gods. In the gods. Because they were so childishly naturally religious, that is, mythic. <laughs> yeah. well, so we could go in that direction, but we're not. <laughs> yeah, you know. Other than to say that from the conquistadors to the, to the gold seekers, to the Puritans, Indios have been systematically removed and sequestered into reservations where they still live the earth myth. But I'd rather end this way, <laughs> which is to go back into the Greek. He, Hesiod, you know, gives us uh, gives us this this great picture of the of the of the stages of man, the ages of man. 
and it, and it's an imagination of there's a great imaginal figure, its head is made of gold, fine gold, its neck is made and its neck and chest and arms are made of silver, its stomach and thighs are bronze and legs of iron. And that's his picture for, you know, as man evolves, he's going to he's going to move further and further into pain and strife and further away from from the golden golden age and move into into uh, due to his self will due to self will so it's it's meant to kind of a, be a symbol of the dev devolution of the human but let's hold on to that one just a second uh, it, this image occurs two more times, at least two more times. The second time it occurs, it's in the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, you know, when, uh, when Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, he knows important, that's important, he can't remember the dream, and none of his counselors can, but Daniel can remember the dream for him and give the interpretation. It's the same ages of man, right? except in this one, the, that figure has, has some of its toes are no longer uh, iron, but they're clay. They're clay. Then there's a third, and, and Daniel, the picture of Daniel in the furnace, that's the picture of our age. It's, it's, a, it's a picture of we're in the furnace, there's no way out. We're in the furnace, so what do you do? <laughs> so you don't crack it. We've gone too far. We've damaged too much. <laughs> How do you stay in the furnace? That's what Daniel works with. But there's a third image, an amazing image in the 13th century, and it's uh, St. Francis of Assisi has a vision, and in his vision, it's a vision of a woman um, it, it's a woman with a head of gold, a bosom and arms of silver. Her abdomen is of crystal, and from the waist down, she's, she's, it's iron, and she's wearing a soiled mantle, a soul, a soil mantle, an earth mantle. <laughs> and... St. Francis marries her, spiritually marries this image. This image is Lady Poverty. Lady Poverty. Lady Poverty. L Lady Poverty is earth. Lady Poverty is humus, earth, soul, body. Look at Francis. Look at him, what he does. He stands out there like a tree with the birds on him and a bird on his head pooping, <laughs> you know, welcoming the, the, the fox, uh, making the, the, the canticle of the canticles, brother, son, sister, moon. He's earth. He's earth. So we don't, I mean, poverty doesn't mean what we think it means. Poverty means earth doesn't need anything. We don't need anything because as humus beings, as humus earth beings, we're not here to possess anything. We're here to praise the gods. We're here to praise the gods as we've done for the past day and a half. Thank you.